I've collected transistor radios for a long time. The one we're looking at today would be considered by many to be the most important transistor radio I have. That rubs me the wrong way. It's pronounced brown, they tell me. I don't mind saying it right, but that puts me in the position of saying it differently than every other English speaker because they say brawn. I don't like sounding like a smartass or sounding wrong either, so this name seems like a source of unnecessary conflict. And while we're pronouncing things, there's this, Dieter Rams. He's the designer, the famous designer at Braun, uh, Brown, who is known for his minimalistic approach to damn near everything. And I'm sure I got his name wrong, too. Okay, now that we've got the celebrity talk out of the way, let's talk about this radio as a radio just like any other object I look at in these videos, because, remember, someone designed all the things I look at. Most of the designers toiled, as the saying goes, in obscurity. But that doesn't make their work any less important or valuable. We get the pleasure of seeing and appreciating their work, even if we don't know their names. The very notion of designer this and designer that is a recent phenomenon, if you didn't know. People today talk of designer handbags and designer shoes, and even collectors refer to the Raymond Lowy Studebaker and Virgil Exner's Fins. We didn't used to talk about such things. They were just Studebakers and Dodges. We enjoyed the cars and the shoes and all that. We just didn't have to turn it into a celebrity thing. We're obsessed with celebrity these days. Even in politics, if a pop culture celebrity decides he or she wants to run for political office, no more qualified than any of the rest of us, they are automatically the front runner. And the media, obsessed with celebrity, just amplifies the problem. Oh, enough about that. I do like this little brown T3. Its clean lines are its strongest point. It's a two-band radio, and there's a switch on the back for selecting the MW band or the LW band. Now, I don't speak German, but I think this stands for Medium Wave und Long Wave, yeah? It's said to have been the inspiration for Apple's iPod, but then the Regency TR1 is said to have been the inspiration for Apple's iPod. I don't think Apple's designers would have come up with anything different had neither of these transistor radios ever existed. I know that's heresy coming from a transistor guy like myself, but I'm also a design guy, if I may so self-designate, and that seems obvious. You might as well say the Brown from 1958 was inspired by the Regency from 1954. I don't think I would, but you might. The case is like nothing I've seen on any other radio, with this flap for easy access to the front. Usually a case for a transistor radio will have cutouts for the knobs and holes in the front of the speaker to let the sound through. But there aren't any holes here, so I guess it's good that there's a flap. And you're going to need that flap open to tune it, too, since there's no cutout for the tuning knob. If we're grading on form follows function, as we have every right to, since that's the classroom Brown has chosen to lecture in, I'd have to give this case an F but maybe I just don't understand it. Okay, I admit it, I don't understand it. And I don't know or understand what this bunching up is that appears on the bottom. This zipper pull, I do understand. It's a paper clip. Did what was originally there break? Or was this case so minimalist 
that it had no zipper pull on it at all, and a user somewhere along the way added a paper clip just so he or she could grip the damned thing. Inside, the radio looks impressive enough, solid and well-built. This battery business looks like yet another mystery to me. There seems to be a battery compartment in the radio and another one up under the lid or back, each area holding two penlight batteries. I don't see how the batteries in the lid connect into the circuit, or are they just some kind of spares? This seems like an overly fussy arrangement. The power source is already the part of any portable radio most prone to fail. A design approach that deals with that failure point would be a step forward. I don't think that's what we're seeing here. It looks like I'm missing a couple of those springs that help hold the batteries in. And what's with this battery clip? It looks like a 9-volt battery clip, but sometimes those are used with battery holders holding penlight batteries. I don't know. Something is definitely amiss here. Perhaps it has been modified along the way. But even that begs the question, why? Why would it be modified if it hadn't first failed in some way? We find a circuit diagram tucked up inside the back with teeny tiny printing on it. Under a literal microscope, I was able to see that the radio's power requirement is 6 volts, which would be delivered by four penlight cells. So those two batteries up under the back are not spares, but are indeed in the circuit. How they connect remains a mystery. The brown T3. Maybe I'd be a little more charitable toward Brown and its design philosophy if it weren't for my experience with their digital thermometer. Now let me ask, what's going on with you when you need a thermometer to check your temperature? You're not feeling well, right? If you're like me, you've got to be feeling pretty lousy before you get out the thermometer. So you're feeling pretty badly, and you reach for your fancy brown thermometer with the digital readout, the one that you stick in your ear to take your temperature. Quick and easy, was the sales pitch. Okay, I can grab an old-style analog mercury thermometer with one hand, but it takes two hands to get at this thing because it has to be taken apart from its convenient cradle. Now, how do you turn it on? Remember, you're already feeling lousy. How do I turn this damn thing on? There's no on-off switch, of course, because that would be too maximal. And this product is minimal. You push its two buttons, nothing happens. Battery is dead. No temperature for you. Seriously, no backup of any kind. Well, that's harsh, I think. So you find the battery compartment and open it up to find what? A quarter. A battery that looks like a quarter. Remember, you are not feeling well at this moment. Now, how am I supposed to have one of those batteries lying around the house? I have some pen lights, of course, and some 9 volts like anybody else. But nobody has those little disc batteries lying around. Nobody keeps spares of those there's like a billion different kinds of them anyway, all slightly different and wrong. At this point, I fume at the money I spent for this now useless thermometer and reach for my old analog thermometer. So in a couple of days, when I'm feeling better, I go to the store and I get those weird batteries for my brown thermometer. So next time, I'll be ready. And sure enough, a few months later, one of my family members seems to be running a fever. Wait right here, says I. We'll just stick this thing in your ear and find out. How do I turn this thing on? Here we go again. I push some buttons and, okay, some numbers and some tiny little symbols come up on the LCD screen and they start blinking at me. This means what? I don't want to play a video game. I want to take a temperature. How? I'm trying to remember. Do I need to clear the screen? How would I do that? What do the two buttons do? They don't say, of course. 
They have little symbols by them. One symbol looks like a flash bulb you'd see on an old camera, and the other looks like a target. I need words. Where are the words? I'm not interested in taking pictures or in archery at this moment. I'm trying to take someone's temperature. So, okay, I figure I'll just stick it in the ear and see what happens. Then I remember something about gently tugging on the earlobe when you do that. I can't remember, so I get out the owner's manual. That's right, an owner's manual for a thermometer. And it's a good thing I did, because I learn how ignorant I am and how to position the thing just right in the ear, and I learn that there is another button, unmarked, of course, that I have to push to actually take the temperature. And so... I do it. Beep, beep. My family member, who, remember, is not feeling well, thinks I'm an idiot. And I feel like an idiot. Products that make the user feel like an idiot. This seems to be a growing trend. Maybe you've noticed. It's bad enough when it's done by companies to cut costs and make things cheap. But to make products that make their users feel stupid, and to call this a design philosophy, that's a little much. The fact that some of us are stupid is no excuse.